I would begin by, by um, sort of raising the issue of power uh, and um, the question of who is, who is history for? What is, what is the function of history in society as la at large? Um, because the, the intriguing thing about um, storytelling, individual lives, and the notion of decentering is that um, history speaks when written as well as, as, as you do, um, speaks very directly to the individual and to groups, perhaps. But um, if, isn't there also um, the idea that um, history can be about the greater issues of power? Um, that global history can be what Emmanuel Wallerstein does um, or did. Uh, Sort of mapping the, the, the greater patterns of power and, and asking uh, the huge questions about the forces that shaped people's lives in the past and what forces still do. Um, is, is there a danger that um, decentering and storytelling will tone down questions of power? You're, are you looking at me? <laughs> I'm yes. just looking at the panel. Well, yeah. uh, I don't think anyone here is saying that, 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 I'll speak for myself maybe, but I don't think any of us are saying that ours is the only way to, to, to write history or, or the only kind of history that people want to read. Uh, it is tr uh, or, or that this is, this is a, 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 in, in dialogue with the, 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 I'm sitting next to someone who's written a, a, a history that is, goes from pre-colonial, pre, pre, not pre-colonial, the fourth, what century, over a thousand years. BC. Yeah, twenty-four. <laughs> so you know, we, on this panel of storytellers, we have someone, who, and and Bonnie has done global, a global study. So even on our panel, we represent different ways of doing history. Uh, my, my objection to Wallerstein's formulation was not its. It's uh, effort at, at doing a big history or a grand scheme. Uh, I, I had my own personal objection was the, the notion that you always had to have, that if you always talked about it in terms of the center and periphery, you were almost prejudging your outcome and that you could still tell a grand story about economic and power, economic, uh, without using that particular kind of categorization. It rigidified it. But it was not, in my case, was not an objection to uh, uh, doing a, a, a broad scale of history. I think you have to do both kinds. But. You're looking at me. Well, anybody <laughs> else want to comment on it? Well, I, I think that, um, just, just to go back to, to power, I think that, in fact, this move to decenter history, and certainly the, his, the, the story Natalie was telling about her own formation and about the experience of many of us doing social history um, and then other things, and, and even and then global history, um, has to do with uh, first challenging the um, dominant narratives of those stories, the dominant developmental, the thing you mentioned at the beginning that about history not being a matter of development but of, of diversity. Um, so it was a, it was meant to challenge a kind of primary developmental model, which assumed that uh, Western ways of doing things were the end point of the history of, of the world um, and meant to illustrate the way power operated in all sorts of other ways and other places, the Foucauldian influence, which mm -hmm. would say uh, that power isn't only about sovereigns and, and uh, the rulers of nation states, but also about relationships which escaped the, the view before of power, doctor, patient, men, women, uh, teacher, student, uh, peasant, and so on and so forth. So I, I think it, it comes not only from the notion that uh, we're challenging a powerful narrative that had that put in place certain visions and justifications for the way the world was organized, the hierarchies in which the world was organized, but that also um, we were looking at new definitions of what power actually meant mm -hmm. in ordinary lives as well as in the big stories mm -hmm. of, of the big structural forces that had been looked at before. And, and I think we would hope that uh, those who are writing 
the, 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 the grand narratives, uh, some of us maybe do, do this, would write it differently. That is, uh, by uh, this other kind of exploration of the way power works in, in other settings uh, and the way resistance works. That is, I think that, that, that the decentering history can also change the story of big resistance movements and big revolutionary movements when you look at it uh, in other settings. But, but I, just, just to add one thing, I think that as historians, we also have to take into account the influences on us as we did our history. And um, the, the various political moments in which these turns came, um, the one of, of social history, certain at a moment, at least in the United States in the 1960s, of uh, a civil rights movement, of women's movements, of various social movements claiming a kind of representation that they had not had before in history. And none of us, I think, think of ourselves as official historians, that is, um, trying to sort of give movements their histories. At the same time, there was no way that we weren't influenced by those movements to think about the questions they were raising in the history that we did. And the global turn has everything to do with a post-colonial yeah. uh, uh, emergence of new nations, a uh, question of what clashes of civilization do or do not mean mm -hmm. for, uh, for the present. I, mean, I think there's no way Natalie would have returned to Ibn um, Khaldun. Khaldun without yeah. uh, the, the, the question that surrounds us now of whether there can be coexistences of uh, civilizations in, in the, the discourse of the clash of civilizations. Same with David's work, I think, and um, Bonnie's. Well, uh, even uh, the most accepted definitions of power concern culture. And Antonio Gramsci said you can rule by force or you can rule by consent, which would include culture. One part of decentering history has involved culture. And uh, what I'm hoping people will do is see the power of cultural forms. That is when uh, someone like um, Coleridge is taken in and absorbed almost by Asian thought. It's the lure, it's the power of the other culture that uh, has such sway over him and it has sway over so many people and forms a, ki a kind of power that we only see once we decenter history away from seeing, say, Coleridge as the agent. It's a part of the paper I had to leave out and the lure, the power of that Asian thought or an Asian product or an African product. So I think there's a lot of power that is involved in decentering history. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, he, hearing the name of Ibn Khaldun, I'm reminded, of course, that he's very interested in a particular type of power, political power and the rise and fall of empires. And he has this sort of rhythmic view of, of how empires come together and then the sort mm -hmm. of internal disintegration that takes place, which reflects his own experiences mm -hmm. in North Africa, you know, living among Arabs and Berbers and so on. Um, I suppose what, what I would want to point to as somebody who has also had, of course, uh, to deal with the, the big political events in the history of the Mediterranean. What struck me very forcibly, actually, it goes back to the awful moment when one has to put one's proposal to the publisher. <laughs> and <coughs> uh, Penguin, uh, they're, they're, you know, they want a sort of detailed proposal, understandably. And so <coughs> I remember saying, look, this book is not going to be about the sorts of people necessarily that you expect to be right at the front of the narrative. Uh, there will be a lot of these merchants, um, people going off into the sort of dim, misty Western Mediterranean in the Greek pe period, in the early Greek period, and so on. Um, people it's difficult to sort of um, pin down, uh, really get to know. But these are the people who, they're exercising a sort of, it, I mean, their cultural influence, their influence on the spread of particularly religious ideas, also their economic influence, that in many ways we have to push this particular narrative to the front, and then the big political narrative somehow sort of fits around that, and you begin to realize that the political events are sometimes molded by the shaping of the 
trade networks, cultural connections, things. I mean, I referred to Carthage when I was speaking earlier, which is a marvelous example of a place that emerges as a trade center, then cultural center, then becomes the center of a great political empire, which sets off something quite extraordinary, the emergence of Rome against its own will. You know, the Romans didn't want to create an empire in the Mediterranean, for at least not originally. So um, these relationships between sort of power understood as big political power and the cultural, economic, social developments. It's a very fascinating mm -hmm. sort of issue. Mm -hmm. Just, just one, one last thing following on uh, David Abelafia's remark. The thing that I think would be most, uh, will be most fruitful uh, in designing uh, world histories or grand schemes will be those that are generated uh, out of traditions different from those, our traditions, Western traditions, and uh, I mean genuinely, I don't, uh, not, not just people uh, who uh, happen to come from other parts of the world and, but have gotten their PhDs at, at Princeton or whatever, but really who are working out of a, a, another vision uh, and to see, and then putting those together with ways of conceptualizing power and the movements of power and the movements of empires. That's, what I, that's why I love Ibn Khaldun. <laughs> Because this, his image of universal history, which is very powerful, draws upon certain things that are common, Aristotle, for instance, but also draws upon other very different traditions. And that's, I almost always begin every talk I can with Ibn Khaldun, just because he's so useful, <laughs> just for this reason. And, and uh, I would like to see, uh, maybe they exist, Bonnie perhaps knows, conferences, uh, as we just had at, at, at Toronto on tales of slavery, where people, African scholars, uh, working with Africans, they were all working with African sources, but working with in different intellectual traditions and debating among themselves, sometimes overlapping. I would love to see a conference on how to design uh, world history uh, or how to talk about the rise and fall of empires, which would j bring together people from very different uh, intellectual traditions uh, and then see what happens. Uh, uh, that would be that would be decentering. <laughs> yes. That would be really. Well, perhaps recentering. Well, recentering. <laughs> the Chinese. But, would but ask. It, I think something new would, would really come come from that. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, maybe I'll just may I just tell an anecdote, a, a story from a conference that I went to uh, several years ago, and I just began to work on Suriname. And I went to my first conference of the Association of Caribbean Historians, and almost all of them were from the Caribbean. There were a few of us from the United States, but most of them, and uh, the conference was in several languages. Everything was simultaneously translated into three languages to make sure that the English colonies did not dominate the discussion. Uh, there was no Dutch, but the Spanish and the French. And it, I felt that I, uh, and all the things that the people from the Netherlands or the few US people that were there, wanted to have on the agenda were thought of as quite unimportant by the people from the different mm -hmm. islands. I had, and I had never had so powerful experience, even at an international con congress, of people thinking that we were on the wrong track. We were asking the wrong questions. And I didn't always agree with them, but I thought that was so eye-opening. Yeah. They really had a different agenda. And that's the, that kind of thing that I would love to see uh, entering into the grand scheme approach. Uh, Are there any questions or comments from the auditorium? We have a few minutes. Well, um, I, I, we are all right, Stella. Yes. You want to yes. say something? I just uh, became so fascinated by your um, comparison between Christine de Pesson and the Calhoun. And I was thinking, could that be developed into, uh, I mean, why, why just those two? Because they were contemporary, or is there anything particularly um, close between them? And then I was thinking of, why not, for instance, Machiavelli, where you have the whole, I mean, the, the whole Western tradition of political thought from Machiavelli onwards, and then comparing to in Kaloon, who both, like the Westerners, used Aristotle, and probably also developed quite a lot of the same ideas. Yeah. But what happened in the two different, what happened with this tradition in that? Well, of course, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a is she talking to you or to me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I, th I think that that uh, I, I think that in terms of the history of political thought, that would be uh, an important thing to do. To to uh, not not not. I mean, it, it just depends on how you're working. If you're if you're doing a history of political thought, which is particularly following the influence of, of A on B and C, so you're following a tradition through and seeing how it's modified, uh, then you have to see whether Machiavelli had read Ibn Khaldun. I might answer a add that Machiavelli could have heard of Ibn Khaldun from all was on, <laughs> because they were there at the same time. They were there in Rome at the same time, and they were in, 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 in some of the same circles. And, and, and Ibn Khaldun is mentioned in, Mach in uh, al Wazan's, so he might actually have heard of him. <laughs> he might have. <laughs> uh, but, he, but nothing was, was yet translated or available. It would only have been conversation at, at a humanist uh, meeting or sodality of some kind. But, you, but you, you, so you could do that kind of history, uh, and uh, that that would be, I think, it, 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 or, or you could simply do it as a comparative analysis. Uh, the uh, uh, just just as, as, as is often done, schools of political thought, ways of looking at things. Uh, in in the writings of uh, Aziz Al Azmi, who is a very great commentator on Ibn Khaldun, he will locate his uh, Ibn Khaldun's ways of thinking about social relations, social alliance, sodality, uh, and so forth in a very wide spectrum. Uh, by, by making contemporaries, I just wanted to put those two together, partly because I, I happen to have read them once and never thought of I wanted to see if you could take something as, um, as special as book history and intellectual production at the same time in a world where some people are meeting, crossing in the end of Mediterranean, with lots of crisscrossing uh, at, in the early 15th, late 14th century, and see uh, how you could, could, could you make that, that, could you make that a, a, a real story? Was that a legitimate story about intellectual production, uh, about developing a career, about patronage? Uh, rather than as a typology, not, not simply as a typology, a comparative typology, but, but something that, that made you see them as part of the same world in some sense. And especially, I, I think I, I hit it especially when I began to think of the production, the scribal culture part of it. It was at that, was at that moment I thought, really, this is the same world. There's only a few people that they, that they share, Aristotle and I could have mentioned a few others. They both mention in different places, Louis, um, Saint Louis, uh, or, or uh, uh, Christine de Pizan does not mention Eleanor of Aquitaine because she's a little bit too frivolous and uh, possibly adulterous. <laughs> she doesn't want so she, but she does mention uh, uh, the uh, Blanche of Castile, uh, and this figures also. So there's a few figures that are crossovers, but and that's just amusing to find that they that they both have some Im important figures from the past. But it was it was when I began to see them as part of scribal culture that I thought yes, it really does make sense to see them uh, as part of the same world of communication, uh, and, and uh, we, can, we, can, we can broaden our canvas of what we think of as the boundaries, of the geographical boundaries of Western history at that, at that point. Could, could I suggest a, uh, yeah. just another uh, pairing? Um, and that is Ibn Khaldun and Fenon Brodel. And um, I mean, I won't say that you'll find it all in, in Ibn Khaldun already, but some of these ideas about mountains and plains and so on, I mean, it's quite clear where Brodel is drawing on. And the intellectual pedigree of Brodel, of course, that there's a very important element to do with the French colonial presence in yes. North Africa. Oh, so there really are some connections there that, yeah. uh, that are worth exploring. Yeah. Mary Jacobus has her Just one up. more question, Eva Österberg. Well, yeah, I would like to pose a question to, to the whole panel, maybe. You can hear me. Yes. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never mind. Um, it has struck me while listening to all your wonderful presentations <coughs> dealing with, with uh, the global context and also cultural history at the same time, uh, that the, this uh, way of doing history quite often seems to imply that you that one would look upon what one might call trans, trans or cross geographical as well as potentially cross historical phenomena, such as uh, trying to find knowledge or uh, sexuality, 
or gender relations, or maybe even friendship and other things, or exchange, trading, uh, maybe what one might call, call actually universals, universal phenomenon in a sense. But you look, of course, upon that in a cultural variety mm -hmm. and the flux and the change. Uh, but those, uh, but it also means a kind of connection between what is what is variety and what is some kind of trans historical phenomenon. Uh, the, the human man being a social man and trying to and uh, having exchanges and uh, having sexuality and so on, and so on. So, and uh, John Scott also mentioned the ethical aspect of Natalie's uh, work. So what I wonder is, does this way of doing global history in the cultural way also in fact means, means uh, a, uh, a ethical and existential choice? Is it a combination of global history in the cultural context and a ethical and existential turn in the sense that you study general phenomena, existential and ethical, in a country in the right. Hmm. Yes, who would like to comment? Would you want to start on that? Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear your yes. reaction to that. Yes. Um, <laughs> what I'm thinking about, I'm going to home in on a particular aspect, I think. And this is uh, this question which doesn't just apply in a Mediterranean context. It's the question of um, studying the sorts of things I study because I am actually interested in the question of toleration and how that's expressed. And I think there is, there is therefore, you know, there are some very big sort of ethical questions that emerge out of that. Um, but as a historian, of course, I also want to stand back from that. So I might say to you, if I'm in a particular mood, I might say to you, oh, well, all this talk of the three religions coexisting in Spain, it's all so exaggerated and so on, and, and there were some very dark moments and so on. But underneath this, there is, I think there is an interesting ethical question about how as well, we ought to behave towards one another. And also looking at the darker moments and seeing um, uh, I mean, periods of, of persecution, expulsion, the Jews from Spain, or whatever. Here are moments which one wants to understand, to understand, you know, why is there popular support for this? And why do rulers want to take these measures and so on? What does it mean for the victims? So um, I think there are some, that's the ethical dimension which I think comes through to me most powerfully, but that may not be quite what you're thinking of. It, does that... Does that go part of the way, anyway? Yeah. Yes, my own study, which go of cultural exchange, goes from uh, 1650 to the present, and it had a very specific moment uh, when it began in my mind, and it was when, uh, after 9/11, uh, Lynn Cheney, the wife of the vice, then vice president, said that this. Uh, attack shows that the United States must study its own unique and um, self, sort of um, auto-generated culture and values. And I knew this wasn't true. And at the same time, Amartya Sen wrote an opposing piece, which, said in, uh, which was in the New York Times that said, where does culture begin? Where does culture end? He said, my own uh, native culture was a big stew. It was all religions. It was all forms of art. It was everything, uh, all mixed up together. And so um, I knew that European culture had a great deal of other influences. And in fact, in world history, Jerry Bentley, one of the uh, pioneers in world history said, cultural exchange goes back um, at least 100,000 years. And so there is, in my mind, in creating this, and it's certainly there in Natalie's book, a sense, and uh, as um, David Abelafia has said, where do we begin and where do we end? And so it's important, I think, in writing these things to show, as Natalie does in, 
um, Trickster's travels, well, what were his limits? And, but where did he intersect? And all these questions that have come up today. So I, I agree with you that there's a, a deep ethical um, ground and some probing of the human condition that's going on with this effort at decentering. I would just add one thing, which is, which is it seems to me that if there's a, a human universal, it's the thing I said in, in, in my talk, it's, it's that difference is what marks us all, whether, yeah. whether internally uh, we are differentiated, that is we don't come into existence without some other recognizing that we exist, um, and that difference is what marks our relations um, with others. Uh, in all sorts of, of ways. And it seems to me that there, it's only historical knowledge, or it's in part at least historical knowledge, that gets you at these questions of difference, how they're negotiated, how they're dealt with, when they lead to violence and when they don't, when they become, um, when it becomes possible for people to accommodate difference or tolerate it, uh, and when, when not, who the agents of uh, difference are. So it, it seems to me that if there's a universal, the universal has to do with difference. With the, or, or maybe the, the sort of paradox of universality is that uh, it's, it's in its particularity mm -hmm. that uh, we, we come to know uh, what it is and who we are. And, and otherwise, <coughs> it seems to me you end up in the, in the French case in which the French assume that universalism belongs to them. And, and the rest of the world has, has mm -hmm. missed the point of, of their universalism. Mm -hmm. You don't want to end up there, and you don't want this kind of exclusionary universalism that presumes its own um, self-definition, but instead the emphasis on difference as the fundamental trait of the human condition. I think if we could start thinking in those terms, we would have a very different way of imagining uh, relations among, among peoples. And historians are a group who are in a particularly good position to teach that, universe, to teach that story of difference. I agree completely with the strategy, but nevertheless, we presuppose some Yes, yes. I, I was going to uh, pose, because I, I, you and I have talked a little bit about this, start with Joan. I was going to also make some reservations about the word, word universal. Uh, though I used it in connection with Christine and Ibn Khaldun on purpose, because they would have used it. But, but it, it has been, uh, uh, it, it, it is so it carries with it such a, a, a burden, maybe in some ways burden of, a burden of things we, some of us agree with, but it's such a burden of meaning that, uh, uh, but the way, I, the way I'd like to address the question of universal, though, is that when you look at all these different places, you, uh, you, you, have, uh, you as an historian will both have a sense of different patterns. I'm not here now thinking less philosophically and just more practically than mm -hmm. Joan. Of different patterns, and occasionally you'll see things that are familiar. There's always that interchange between the two. And, and uh, in, in order to get around this question of backwardness, <laughs> or evolutionary schemes that always privilege one way, what, what I tend to think to look for are uh, what I call equivalent forms. Let's take the question of tolerance. Uh, uh, that, that there are, are several ways uh, that different societies uh, work out pattern, solutions, it's tolerant solutions. They're having laws, constitutions, charters, uh, and, and apparatus that, that uh, govern these. But as recent work has been showing, uh, on uh, early modern Europe and elsewhere, there are all kinds of ways that practices of tolerance can be put in. There are equivalent ways of doing practices of tolerance. And I think, I think that's, a, uh, that's a helpful word to, uh, it, it, it's, you see there, they may be different in their forms, but they accomplish some of the same goals as letting people uh, living, living together without killing each other. So I think it's, um, without, without looking, it may, it may be in some political settings important to hold on to, say, this is a universal value. I'm thinking, but as an historian, it may be uh, better to, as, to look for the patterns of child rearing that, have, that are either equivalents or, or looking for the differences in pattern of child, uh, patterns of child rearing, uh, difference in, in gender relations, look first for that, but then see, see where in some sense, 
uh, let's take issues of equality. There are several different ways that you can end up with an equivalent equality without being exactly alike. Uh, so I, I think that that might be a better practice for us. In terms of uh, the ethical commitment, uh, I certainly always have it, but, uh, but uh, you know, and I think with Bonnie, it's partly the, the topic that you take and, and you, you write your history so that it becomes a critical history and, 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 and reshapes the political or ethical question or contributes to it. I mean, you know, all of us would agree that you don't write a partisan history, uh, that you, you, don't, you don't, that doesn't dictate what you find. You're, you let your evidence speak for itself. Uh, and uh, that happened, things, when I took Always On, I took, I was working on Always On, Leo Africanus. I started it before 9-11. 9-11 just made me all the happier that I had taken it. But it didn't turn out. Um, some of the things that I had wished he had said or had done, it didn't happen. <laughs> I, would have, I would have liked it to have been a little bit different. I wanted him to go back to North Africa and write a book about Europe. <laughs> That's what I really wanted. Provincializing Europe. It didn't happen that way. But you could still, uh, so you accept what you get. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, I've never found that the past have failed. It's always, it's never let me down. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of wanting to write a kind of critical story that, that helped uh, uh, us think about ways of, uh, that, that helped us be realistic about the problems of power uh, and the problems of violence, but helped us at least think about the possibilities of living a little bit more peacefully. It truly, no matter how terrible it's been, I don't know if you'd agree here, I have, have never let, it, it's never let me down. <laughs> never, it's, it's, you know, it's just always there. I'm sure we could continue this very interesting conversation for a long, long time. I promised one last question. It must be very short, and I hope Mary some Jacobs, very yeah. interesting short answers. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank you. Um, well, my question is, is literary. It would be, wouldn't it? And, and I was so delighted that Bonnie started with, with, lit, with romantic literature. And just, just to take up the last question, the, the last uh, point that Natalie made, there was a... a a rather conservative English feminist who wrote the tale, called Elizabeth Hamilton wrote the tales of an Indian Raj to give the, as it were, Indian perspective on the incredibly conservative uh, gender arrangements of, of Britain in, in, during the Romantic uh, period. And, and she concluded that Scotland was the best, much more enlightened place than, than England, actually. But all using the, the trope of, of, of India to turn the tables, as it were, on, on the, the, the Western Enlightenment. But what, what, my, my serious question is that I, I was very impressed not only by the way in which the kinds of evidence might decenter history, but by the question of the literary representation, which Bonnie, I think, started and which also Joan Scott took up in, in using Benjamin uh, uh, on the storyteller and the Russian writer um, Le uh, Leskov. And I think uh, Natalie's own work, um, particularly focusing on the, the, the poetry, the, in, the involvement of, of writing poetry uh, of people like Averroes commenting on, on Aristotle's poetics and indeed uh, her, her own Leo Africanus. Uh, and I wondered uh, also, of course, um, thinking about David's focus on the sea, not the, the land, but the sea. And of course, the great sea poem is the, the Odyssey. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the way in which the discipline of history has itself been transformed by taking on the way in which the tale is told, whether by those who are the subjects of history or by the historians themselves. I wonder if you could give short answers to this very interesting question. Well, my short answer is that there's been a tremendously important influence. and and. Uh, being forced to think about literary forms uh, has given us a new sensitivity to many of the sources that we that we work with, uh, and you can see it in in something like the way Natalie reads stories. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other people here are just nodding their heads. Does it mean that yeah. we, you you agree, or would you like to say something? Else? There's well, universal consensus. Um, I'd, no, I'd like to say something very brief, which is that a uh, recent PhD student of mine 
uh, read the manuscript of this book, and he said, oh, well, you've used the travel account of Ibn Jubayr, who goes on pilgrimage to Mecca across the Mediterranean in the 12th century, but don't you realize that these figures, the number of people he puts on ships, are totally impossible and, and totally exaggerated? And there I am, of course, suddenly realizing that I've got to read this text um, more from, as it were, a literary perspective. So I think this is an area where um, historians probably have quite a lot to learn still, but we're beginning to take that on board. Uh, that example from your student uh, is a perfect one to make the, my point, that we use, uh, we, we use the literary questions, we put literary questions to our sources uh, not to undermine them, <laughs> Uh, but to give added understanding of, of the people that we're studying about. Uh, they, they are, they're as important as a plantation inventory <laughs> uh, to, uh, to, to look at the shape uh, of, of a text and uh, not to unmask the writer as a liar, but to have the writer appear as someone showing the tropes and the metaphors, the way he, uh, the world is understood. So it's been a, a big addition to our a uh, bag of tricks. <laughs> I'll just say briefly, I like in my own work to see the way literature has produced people's lives, where it, where it produces the life of Coleridge or Coleridge's daughter. So the power of literature to create a person. Now I want to thank all participants, all for participants, also by giving the final word to Professor Bill. Oh. Well, this is obviously a kind of symposium that could go on and go on and go on. <laughs> it just proves how uh, fruitful this has been. And I'd like to once more to thank uh, Professor Simon Davis and this eminent panel for giving us this uh, fantastic, interesting experience, and which means that we will just have to go on working with the ideas and the insights that you have given us uh, part to today. So thank you very much once again. We have enjoyed it so much and this is so much what we had hoped for and in the spirit of the Holbert Prize. Oh.